After the establishment of Sydney Cove in 1788, European smallpox spread like wildfire across the Eora nation within Sydney. Just as quickly, it cut through the Karingai tribe 90 kilometres north, spanning from Broken Bay to Tagora Lake. Within months, the population was decimated, and by the year we'll be starting our focus at 1825, 80 to 90% of the population had simply vanished. Within this vast devastation, the oral history passed down through generations was lost forever. In the 1790s, Bangari, a Kuringai warrior, left the region possibly due to the disease raging through and joined the settlement at Sydney Cove. He is the only available artistic depiction of a man who came from Broken Bay. Unfortunately, he is painted wearing European military attire and on his chest plate, gifted to him in 1815 by Governor Lachlan Macquarie, dubs him as Chief of Broken Bay, despite this not being the truth. This is a short example that reveals how little they cared to understand the Aboriginal culture. Much of what the tribe's true customs were, real name was, even what their tribe name was, no longer exists in the records. Kurungai is a name invented by the white ethnologist John Fraser in 1892 in his An Australian Grammar. The name does not appear in earlier records. A census of Brisbane Water dated 7th of March 1829 gives a good idea of what was going on at the time. Between 47 free men in the region, 14,850 to 15,790 acres of land was occupied. To put this into perspective, the actual amount they had managed to clear by 1829 was just 281 acres, or 1.77% of the total. These vast land grants meant isolation for these settlers. William Cape, for example, lived over 19 kilometres away from any other settlement. Cape, arriving in 1822 and quickly founding what would become Sydney Grammar School, was granted approximately 1,090 acres in the Tugger and Wyong area in 1827. What I need to note now is the image that I have put is his son, William Timothy Cape, as no photo is available for William Cape. Despite William Cape's station, he was notorious for inciting the local Aboriginals to violence, as letters found in the court petty sessions from 1828 reveal. It was stated by another settler, Mr Willoughby Bean, Reverend Willoughby Bean, on April 25th. Cape fired on them, the Aboriginals. During the night, when they tried to steal his corn. Mr. Bean also writes, I beg to know what it streams I may go in repelling them and, if any be taken, if I may use my own discretion, in punishing them even with corporal punishment or other ways they may be disposed of. What is clear from these letters is that due to simple reprisals by the Kurungai tribe, against the thieves who had taken their ancestral home, the white settlers were asking the government for a literal license to kill. Gosford Court letters and petty sessions from 1835 and 1838 to 1841 tells of six Aboriginals being apprehended and sentenced for pillaging crops, along with a document titled Returns of Aboriginal Blacks, in brackets Gosford, Brisbane Water, respectively. These two documents match a secondary source that I will have to rely on as it appears to be the only full account of what was going on. It was created by the local poet and writer Henry Kendall, published by him with the title Arcadia at Our Gates on the 6th of March 1875. By the late 1830s, 
the Karingai tribe led what would be their final major stand against the Free Settlers. By 1842, the government sent a force to quote-unquote dispose of the tribe. Henry Kendall betrays the violence that transpired, stating in Arcadia, at our gates. The military showed great barbarity. In the middle of the night, camp after camp was surprised and their occupants, men, women, and children, shot down like native dogs. <laughs>